parts of it. And initially it was more along the lines of techniques. And then the last two or three years, I've had some huge big changes in how I view things. And so now I can actually tell people how I made those mental changes as well, because I had to, you know, the thing about say, let's say like Tom Dorrance, okay? He didn't meditate, he didn't have mindfulness practices, he didn't go to yoga, he didn't do any of those things that a lot of people these do these days to, to kind of get that inner peace thing going on. He just had that. He and so because he just had it, I don't think they knew to even tell people about it because they didn't even know they had it because it was just part of who they were, you know what I mean? And that's uh -huh. I see a lot of talented people are that way too. They can do things without knowing how they do them. But this is not so much the doing. This is the who you are on the inside thing, which I really think is probably the biggest part of the whole getting along with horses. But those guys were, you know, Tom Durrance was like Buddha or Jesus Christ or whatever. I mean, like they were kind of like enlightened beings, but they didn't, they didn't, like I said, he didn't read Eastern philosophy and, you know, any of that sort of stuff. But at, at its core, that's what it was. And so what I've found these days is um, at clinics and stuff, I start out, I do a big old two hour long talk before we even go anywhere near the horses about that whole, I don't know, the inner landscape of yourself, you know, like working on different things like you know, like judgmental thoughts and just a lot of stuff like that. And it's really made a huge difference with people as yeah. how they get along with their horses. Cause it's less about techniques and it's more about changing just how you view the world. You know, It really is. And I love how you say inner landscape because it is a landscape. And I also love how you say um, Tom Dorrance was just a being, you know, that, and that's what he was. He was just, he was just pure more, just, I don't want to say pure because none of us are pure, but pure being, you know, he just, he was there, he was present, he was grounded, he was, he was coming from this joyful inner spirit. Now, I've never met him, but I just, I've, you know, I've studied him ever since I was yeah. a kid, yeah. you know, and, and it's this, it's this pure energy that makes sense to the horse. It's so easy for them to understand. And then it's just, it's, it's beauty moving forward. But he even said, um, I, I I, you know, I don't want to conjumble it too much, but he said as he got older, he realized even more how much less it needed to be or how little it could actually take. And I don't for, remember where I, where I had read that, but I thought that was interesting that even for him, it was a journey. You know, it's not just, mm -hmm. just a journey for each and every one of us that isn't perfect and isn't good, but even for the true masters, it's, yeah. it's a journey. Yeah. Which is inspiring because that means there's always room to improve, which means we get to learn all the time, which is awesome. Yeah, the, other, the other good thing about understanding it's a journey is you can slow down Yeah. because there is no end. It's not like, Oh, if I could just get to, cause there is no end. And so it kind of, it kind of makes you, and that's, I think that's a big part of it. It makes you happy to what's going on. You, you don't feel the need to get to the next thing. You know, um, it's very process oriented, you know, oriented versus, versus results oriented. And, and people that I've met that have, were around Bill and Tom, they said, especially Bill, very, very process oriented. And, the, the, and I'll get back to the whole enlightenment thing here. The most spiritual of the ancient Hindu practices was something called karma yoga and karma yoga is applying yourself to a task with no thought as to the outcome of that task. Oh, That's what he did. <laughs> totally. I mean, it's just doing it, do, you know, it's just doing it with not doing it because this is going to get me this. You, you are just doing it. And a friend of mine from New Zealand, her name is Jane Pike. She's a horse riding mental coach. Oh, you posted something recently. So she was our mental coach when we went to the World of Question Games last year. Um, but she posted something recently and she said, if you're doing the work, if you're doing the work with your eye on the outcome, you're not actually doing the work. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, yeah it's, it's that. It's just that whole, and like you said, it's, it's just being present. And if you're present, you're not thinking about the outcome because there is no outcome if you're present. You just, whatever's in front of you is what you're 
and what you're working with. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I've got two kids, one's six and the other's 11. And right out the front door, or not front door, but my window up here, I'm seeing her graze her pony. And, you know, the, and they'll, they'll come up to the back door with the ponies and they will just leave them there, not tied or anything, come in the house, do stuff, the horse weight's there, no problem. You know, there's this, the kids have it so naturally and so so easily it's not it's just it's just they're just being with the horse and right, they're yep. green yeah so, i call i call that 10 year old girl training yeah <laughs> you know, and i've had to you know i did that as a kid but i've had to get back to that because i was a professional horse trainer for a long time where i bring you the horse you get it out you work with it you put it back you're training it to do something and i you know i kind of got away from that whole you know, just being with them stuff. And uh, it wasn't until I actually stopped, you know, I stopped training horses for the public a few years ago. And it wasn't until I stopped doing that that I really, really started connecting with the horses a lot more because we had our horses at home. You know, we bought a place, so we've got our horses at home. They're right outside the kitchen window here. I can see them right now. And yeah, that's a, you know, I was at a, I was at a horse expo in New Zealand a couple of years ago. And um, I'm just, le I'm leaving this Friday to go back to the same expo. And uh, I had to do a demo one afternoon and it was um, problem solving under saddle was the name of the demo. Okay. And so I, I turn up for the demo and I'm waiting for the horse to come in and this lady leads in this little pony looking sort of a horse with a halter on. Okay. It's got no saddle on it. And I'm like, what's going on here? And she goes, oh, this is a Kamanoa, which is like the Mustang of New Zealand. It's the wild horse of New Zealand. Okay. And said this horse is you know five years old it's been out of the wild for a year or something or other and I said uh, can you ride it because all these people have come to see a problem solving under saddle demonstration right can you ride him and she said oh yeah my my 10 year old daughter rides him I'm like oh. I said does she I said does she ever ride him bareback and she said yeah and I said oh good well I'm just gonna throw the lead rope over here tie it off hop on bareback in the halter and I'll do a problem solving under saddle Deal and whatever pops up. So I threw the rope over, tied it on, hopped on, and as I hopped on, this horse took off bucking down the arena. Some riding this horse bareback bucking down the arena. <laughs> it's a pony nonetheless, which are not as easy as <laughs> not, you know, they're probably they're probably about 13, 2, 13, 3, something like <laughs> kind of slight sort of horses. And I just this horse bucked down the arena and I just reached down to the left and just kind of put a bit of a bend in him to the left and he kind of circled around that went away and we got stopped and said, okay, well, there seems to be the problem. This is my pony bucks under saddle. And the, I think the pony walked off at this point in time and I went to just steer the pony to the right. So I just kind of reached down the lead rope and went to steer to the right. And this pony shook his head twice and I didn't let go. I didn't pull harder. I didn't let go. I just stayed there. He shook his head twice and I didn't let go. So he stopped. Poured the ground twice, I didn't let go. He reared up twice, I didn't let go. And then his head moved very slightly to the right and I let go and I said, okay, that seems to be what we're gonna work on here. This horse doesn't have to turn right. I ask him to turn right, he says, no. So for the next 45 minutes or whatever, I just walk along, I just touch that right rein and he'd stop. Or he'd shake his head twice, then he'd stop, pour the ground twice, rear up twice and he'd move his head. And by the end of the session, I could steer him to the right. Big deal that I could steer him to the right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> So that was the session. So then I got done and they have a night show at this horse expo. And so I had to go inside for the night show and they asked me to judge. They had this thing called New Zealand's Got Talent. And so uh, Vicky Wilson, who won the road to the horse the last couple of years ago, New Zealand girl, she's judging it with me. And Dan Steers from Australia. I don't know if you know who Dan Steers is. He's, I don't. Dan James is in the double Dan's thing. He's the, he's the other partner from Australia. Okay. He's judging it too. And so we're sitting there and the first was the kids thing. And what they do is they bring in some obstacles and it's like a freestyle to music. Some of them are at Liberty or whatever. Anyway, at one point in time, this girl comes in on this little pony. She's riding it around. And all of a sudden I looked at it and I'm like, that's that pony I rode this afternoon that doesn't know anything. Okay. Like as far as you ask him to do something, he doesn't know anything. But she's riding him bareback in a halter and he's going wherever she wants. And at one point in time, she was going to come around in a right turn and there was a, a, a walk the plank type thing on the ground. So it was very narrow. It was probably 10 inches wide and probably about 12 feet long. 
it looks like she's going to have to walk him along it. And as he was coming around, it's a right turn. I'm like, oh, this horse doesn't turn right. <laughs> so I said to Vicky Wilson, I said, I bet you 10 bucks he doesn't go across this. She goes, okay. So she comes around this right turn, rides up to it, and this horse goes like this all the way across. <laughs> there. And some other obstacles. And then she gets off, takes the halter off. And when this horse was on the ground, it was a little bit pushy and pulling on the lead rope and stuff. And she takes the halter off. So now it's at liberty beside her. And she's heads towards that thing again. And I said to Vicky Wilson, watch this. I bet he won't, I'll bet you another 10 bucks he won't go across. Horse went across this thing. And I, I'm thinking, that this horse doesn't know anything. He is not trained to do anything. The aids don't work. Why, did, why, is, why is he doing this? And I'm like, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. Connection. Connection, 10 year old girl stuff. She spent all her time in this world. She hasn't trained him to do anything, but whatever she wants him to do, he'll do because of the connection. I'm like, ah, that's what I'm missing. I've been missing that for 30 years. You know, I, I got away from that. When you get into being a horse trainer, you get away from doing that as a kid. You know what I mean? I do. <laughs> and so, yeah, because she was 10 years old, I call it 10 year old girl training, but she could get this horse to do things that it's not trained to do, yeah. if you ask it to do, that doesn't do it. It's just that connection. So yeah, that's, I really got into like, yeah, that's something I need to do more of is 10 year old girl training. Well, that's so cool because I think that empowers people as well because you don't have to be a good trainer and we all have to be good communicators. So that's something people could work on interpersonally as well as with horses. But it comes back to, which is, it's hard, I think, initially in the thought process, but it, once you realize it, it makes it easier. It's all about working on ourself. And then when we turn it around and realize we're the only one that has to change, that actually is a lot easier than us trying to change everything yeah. else. Yes. Yeah. Which is, which is cool. And I, I but I love that story. It's, it's hilarious, but it completely illustrates that point about it's the connection. Yeah. It's that intention. It's, it's where you're coming from that yeah. matters to the horse. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah, cool. And I've been, like at clinics lately, I've been telling people, you know, you, you, it's all about controlling what you think about. Yeah. where your mind is and also you know and, and then your physiology from that you know um and i i tell people you know if you cannot control you know like i recommend everybody takes up some sort of a meditation practice i say because if you meditation is just about controlling what your mind thinks about a lot of people think it's about not thinking about something it's just about you know you may have your mind focus on your breathing or sensation sitting in the chair or whatever but it's controlling what your mind thinks about and I tell people, if you can't control what your mind thinks about when you're sitting comfortably in a chair in your living room, then you're out trail riding. It's a windy day. Your horse's head goes up, his ears pop up there, and you look up there and there's a plastic bag in a bush and you've got to go past it. If you can't control it when nothing's going on right then I guarantee you, you're going to go to worst case scenario type things. Your butt cheeks are going to clamp up and your legs are going to clamp up and you can just mentally see yourself falling off and then you're like, is it a helicopter or an ambulance going to come here? And which hospital am I going to go to? And I hope I go to this hospital because there's a good back surgeon there and I know I'm going to probably break my back when my horse spooks and, and, and on and on and on. You know? <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Yeah. And, and you know, people I've become aware of, I've met people and become aware of people in the last few years who can mentally picture what they want their horse to do. And I always tell people, if, if those people can mentally picture what they want them to do, you mentally picturing that out on a trail ride is just as good as asking for the, the spook, you know what I mean? And so you've got to be able to control what your mind thinks about. You need to be able to control what you want to happen versus what you, what you don't want to happen. Right, right. And there's that whole kind of thought of, you might know it at the back of your mind, but what are you putting out there really at the front of your mind mm -hmm. and because that that is the horse you know the horse is going to pick up on on those pieces but a lot of times we're all living up here in the front of our mind and and if we're if if the the bad things at the back of the mind are all sitting up here too that that can get us in into some big trouble <laughs> yeah have you ever heard of um danielle barbier i have yeah so his book the alchemy of lightness he talks about have you ever read that book I have. It's been years, um, but I have. 
Yeah. Yeah. He talks about your front mind and your back mind. And that's probably where I got it. <laughs> yep. That's probably where I got it. Yeah. That's a very cool book because it, you know, the subtitle is the molecular connection between horse and rider. And it's all about thoughts and energy and quantum physics -y type stuff, you know, which I'm really into these days. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it's so interesting. This is the other part I really like about horsemanship is when you get to this place in horsemanship, it's so much about your life. And these things that you read about and that the people that you learn from, they completely, they, they, they become a part of who you are and they become um, a way that just, it facilitates so much growth in your life. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't even know where it all comes from, you know, but, but you, you know, when it's right. And, and it changed, it just, it, it, it's, it's lifemanship, you know, it, it changes the way you are in your, in your life. And I think it's one of the greatest gifts horses can give us because I don't know that there are many animals out there that, um, oh, I don't even know how to express it but that can facilitate us learning that about ourselves. Yeah, I actually think that's why they're here. Yeah, I think, I think you're probably right. And I think that's why they, are, why they can seem to be difficult. Yeah. <laughs> all, the, all the difficult goes away when you really change your thought process about what they're actually doing. And you, you know, for a while now, I've been quoting Wayne Dyer, when he says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. I like that, I've heard that. And, and you know, and it's just a thing with, you know, I, I really think there are no difficult horses. Um, you know, they may be having some, you know, people may be having difficulty with them, but they're not really difficult. That's, that's they've been their last option because people haven't been listening to all the little things, you know? Right, definitely. Definitely. And I think, you know, it's, it's like what you're talking about initially that us judging that behavior, you know, so that's another part of us that we're saying that's bad behavior, but really the horse is just surviving and he's surviving because of all of the information that he's gathered throughout his life to that point. And unfortunately, some horses have been through some not so good situations. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means we need to take a huge step back, though from what our expectations are from the relationship and take a look at what the horse, what the horse needs. No, oh, so, yeah, that, that's the big part is, is not having that expectation. Cause if you're having an expectation, you're not listening. You right. are like, okay, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I really think it's about the first thing is like, I'm not going to ask for anything. I'm not going to do anything. I just want you to tell me where you're at, you know, like wait for them to tell you, what needs to be done next, as opposed to telling them what you're going to have them do next. Right. Right. And sometimes it means you just go out and you be that 10 year old girl and you go watch your new pony in the same pasture with them, but you sit and you just sit there and you watch them and you mm -hmm. learn about them and you let them get curious about you. But I think, you know, we're on a time frame. we're checking our watch where our phone is beeping, you know, we're, we're just rushing and we've only got 10 minutes and we feel like we need to get X, Y, and Z done. And what's your recommendation for people that are struggling with that sort of thing?